So I'm here right now to speak on another species we've been working with, fishers. And um, basically what we've done is, is uh, we've come up with a framework or a new tool in, in modeling the exposure of fishers to uh, rodenticides in the hopes of offering um, some mitigation or targeted uh, mitigation uh, options um, for industry. So basically, there's different types of rodent pests in Canada. Um, the ones that are uh, most troublesome and economically detrimental to Alberta are the house mouse, the white-footed mouse, and the meadow voles. Alberta, for the record, is um, allegedly rat-free. There's only two places in the world where you don't find rats, and it includes Alberta and uh, the small island off the coast of Alaska. Um, why do we control rodents? Two main reasons, damage, creates a lot of damage and diseases, especially in areas where you're having a, a large uh, influx and concentration of, of workers uh, living in camps. Um, diseases can be directly transmitted by rodents or indirectly uh, through ticks and other vectors. So we do need to control rodent populations. The estimated damage from, from rodents in the US alone is estimated at $19 billion a year. And this includes uh, damages to crops, uh, to infrastructure, uh, to grains and grain sheds, electrical equipment, um, and plumbing, and uh, this guy didn't do too well chewing on wires in, in an electrical box. But so we do, especially in areas where we have infrastructure that's really costly and for the safety of the workers, we do need to, to control rodents. So usually, um, before oral stands, I, I used to work on, on pesticides. Um, basically, we always preach an integrated pest management approach to uh, controlling rodents. And it includes basically, you know, as basic measures, you know, exclusion, the picking up your garbage, including sanitation. So it's just preventing or modifying the habitat to prevent some of these rodents from causing any problems. There are mechanical traps available too. Um, and there's chemicals they were, we often like to, uh, to turn to. And these includes uh, zinc phosphide, there's a number of vitamins where you're giving the rodents uh, basically an overdose of vitamins. And basically, my focus today is on these anticoagulant rodenticides, where you have the first generation compounds, like the warfarin that you'd find at the Canadian Tire, or the second generation compounds. So these are usually single dose compounds, they're pretty persistent. The first generation compounds are basically, um, they're derivatives of 4-hydroxycoumarin. It's, it's a plant compound. They require multiple feedings. It's subject to bait shyness because the rodent can then associate eating a certain bait and dying. So they become resistant. It's more of a behavioral resistance. Uh, they, they just stop eating it. So our solution to this, well, let's come out with a more persistent compound. It's the same derivative from the same plant products. Instead, um, you know, this time, and just showing you the first generation and second generation compounds, the second generation are bulkier compounds, they're brominated compounds, so they're much more persistent in the liver. Uh, they basically inhibit various enzymes in the vitamin K cycle. These enzymes in the vitamin K cycle is responsible for the production of clotting factors that are really important for, example, uh, healing a wound, which is pr pretty obvious. So the problem with second generation compounds is that they have a greater affinity for these molecular binding sites. They have the ability to disrupt the vitamin K cycle at more than one place. And because they're persistent, they have an unusually long half-life, so they do accumulate in livers of rodents. So the problem with this is that death doesn't occur right away. There's more time spent out in the open versus edges or in hiding. Um, there's more time spent during the day foraging, so there's a higher incidence of rodents dying above ground or out in the open. The problem with that is that then there's a higher probability of these rodents being picked up by scavengers and predators. Um, it's, it's been well supported that uh, rodents that are, um, that are exposed to some of these second generation compounds, uh, they become mini zombies. They're lethargic, they'll, they'll, they're looking for water, they're extremely thirsty. So again, just these changes in behavior uh, makes them um, you know, like a, a vector for these non-target exposures. Is this a new problem? No, it's not a new problem. I, I've published a study in, in 2011 on, on birds of prey. There's a number of different studies talking about these non-target exposures to rodenticides, so it's not new, and it's surely not unique to the oil sands region. Um, 
you know, victims that we often don't think about. An example, foxes here and, and cougars that, again, picking up rodent or, or, or prey that's been exposed to rodenticides and then showing signs of toxicosis becoming really sick. Uh, this is a picture of a fisher, and, and this is something, too, that really piqued my interest when I started speaking with Indigenous communities or, or some of these traditional land users. They were telling me about, oh, sometimes, you know, like, we find fishers that bleed a lot when they skin them, and I found that really interesting. Having worked with birds of prey, that's a red-tailed hawk right here, um, you know, like, so I just clued into that and decided, well, let's just try to screen for these rodenticides. The, the classical victims of these non-target exposures have traditionally been owls and birds of prey. In the UK, there's been, um, there's been evidence of polecats and kit foxes being, um, being documented as, as being exposed to, to second-generation rodenticides. So in the context of my monitoring program, here we have three animal species with similar diets, especially the marten and the fisher, to a lesser, extin uh, lesser extent the lynx. So I thought, why not just screen these, um, these animals for second-generation rodenticides? Why? Because if anybody's like me, we're terrible at reading instructions. Usually when we deploy pesticides, uh, we don't often follow labels. At least, uh, you know, some do. Sometimes I don't. Um, we produce a lot of garbage as, as humans, so uh, we're also a nation that relies on agriculture, the sort of production of, of grain and grain storage areas. So we do need to use active rodent control programs, and um, we are um, in turn having an impact on some of these non target predators. Um, there's been another study, and this was the only documented study on fishers and exposure to rodenticides and fishers, and these had to do with outdoor marijuana grow operations. And this is work um, from California with Dr. Gabriel, and this was the only instance in the literature where the sole source attributed to rodenticide exposures and fishers were from marijuana grow operations. So I was thinking, well, let's provide a new context to this story. Let's screen fishers and martin in an area that with the climate, I assume there's not a lot of outdoor grow operations. Let's look at the oil and gas industry with very sensitive and expensive um, you know, plants and refineries and also large worker camps. So with many workers crammed in together in ATCO trailers, presumably you'd have a very active rodent control program. And so we decided to do this. This, um, these are all trap lines that we've screened fishers and, and martens. The light blue are the martens and uh, the darker blue are the fishers. So much more, many more trap lines were screened for, for fishers than martin. Um, simply because martin are more of a generalist feeder. They'll feed on berries and, and so on and so forth. Whereas fishers are finding more of a specialized diet focus on, on a lot of rodents and snowshoe hare. So more fishers. These are data showing the rodenticide residue levels um, in four treatment areas. So, the, so outside um, bitumen areas, the surface mineable or the mineable oil sands area, the Peace River deposit, and the Athabasca Institute areas. So we're finding that in the surface mineable area, we're having higher frequencies of exposure and higher levels of rodenticides, which speaks to repeated exposures to these persistent compounds. We're still detecting them in control areas. So this, these, some of these fissures came from the Wilmore Wilderness area, which is a really pristine area, and we had fissures that were testing positive for rodenticides, which was quite surprising. The Peace River deposit right here as well. So the top numbers is the number of fissures and the number of trap lines. Um, obviously, lower sample size, I'll acknowledge that, in the surface mineable area, just fewer trap lines and, and fewer trappers. So the, these are the kinds of data that we had to model. And um, Martin, and I'm not showing this data, Martin were on average I was finding that 25% of fishers were, were being detected with uh, rodenticides in, in their livers, whereas Martin, there was more 10%, so lower exposure frequencies and also lower levels of rodenticides. And all of the Martins that we had detected, rodenticides, also came from, from this area where we had um, the greatest uh, frequencies and the highest residue burdens of rodenticides. So what I've done then to 
try to frame this under a management framework was to try to provide some understanding on what governs and what drives some of these patterns and some of these uh, these exposure frequencies to adenosides and fissures. We've done a, a spatial analysis and there's really no difference. So a trap line is a trap. If a trapper is trapping on a trap line, he's not trapping in the middle of a city, obviously. So trap lines on average are less than 1% disturbed. So very few disturbances. What's changing between each area is the, the disturbance type. Um, and we're finding in the control and in the Peace River, the posit areas, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of agriculture. The Athabasca in situ areas is primarily well sites, which is pretty consistent with the nature of, um, of the, the bitumen extraction technology. And in the surface mineable area, obviously we have the, an increased number of open pit mines. And in this category here, the mining category, we also included all of the refining, uh, the, um, the refineries and the worker camps and all of the su supporting industry. So these were 25 different trap lines. And these are the kinds of patterns that we're seeing in terms of disturbance types. And we've only worked with uh, polygons. We didn't look at seismic lines or any of the linear features like roads and highways simply because we're assuming that we're not spreading redenocides on the sides of roads and in the middle of a well site, so, or sorry, a seismic line. So we focus primarily on polygons. So to give you an idea of what these trap lines look like, and I've, I've shown this before, so we've not only modeled and mapped the those anthropogenic disturbances, but we've also mapped the land cover to try to understand how fishers are using the habitat in order to provide some predictive modeling of where we could basically find higher incidences of fishers being exposed to these redenocides. So two examples of two very low level impacted trap lines. So a few well sites here, and, and primarily it's just pretty pristine habitat for fishers, it supports healthy populations. On the other hand, the, the higher disturbance trap lines are, are marked with you know, the, a lot of the mines, some settlements nearby, well sites, oil and gas infrastructure as well, so just the more complex heterogeneous uh, disturbance classes. Um, so basically, the approach that we took is the initial selection, so we've modeled both disturbances and habitat type. We've made an initial selection using a Pearson's moment correlation. We've removed variables that were highly correlated. We've weighted um, the frequencies of exposures by the population sample that each trap line because there is obviously uh, uneven sampling. This is an opportunistic sampling design. Non-normal data was, was log transformed. Um, and then we've used a forward variable selection method to add one variable at a time. And when we, we couldn't find any significance, then, then we stopped. We also used the uh, Akaiki information criterion to select the best model and tested the residuals for all the, the standard assumptions. And the final model passed all tests. So we did a cluster analysis to see the how these frequency of exposure data clustered on the landscape. And we're finding a probability of less than 10% on both the global and local scales that the frequency of exposures is clustering on the landscape due to chance. So there's something explaining these frequencies of exposures, what this means. Um, the model, the final model, uh, basically here, uh, there was three main variables that came into the model. The final R square, so our model explains 66% of the variability, which is a, a good model. Um, we've reduced the significance thresholds to 10% because of the nature of the data. It's complex. There's many drivers, obviously, so we're acknowledging this. So basically, the strongest variable in this model was the, all of the anthropogenic disturbances together. This speaks to the wide use and the widespread use of redenocides on the landscape. So we're finding that those disturbances, any anthropogenic disturbances, explained about 25% of the variance in the model. Uh, the second variable was the, the numbers of mines and, and, and uh, worker camps and refineries. This, this was included in the model as well, and, and quite surprisingly, broadly for us, um, which probably speaks to um, the habitat preference of some of the rodent prey, uh, perhaps in some of these broadly forests, you're getting more berries and, 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 and more foodstuffs for rodents. So perhaps with an increased probability of finding rodents in broadly forest areas, you're most likely picking up poison and rodents as well. This, um, this map here shows we've mapped all of these, so the first variable that I said, all of these anthropogenic disturbances, we've mapped them together. And we've provided the green is, is the, uh, the boreal forest and the gray, the shaded gray areas. 
is uh, anthropogenic disturbances, those five classes that I've spoken of. And we're basically validating some of our modeling by showing that where you have the darker blue circles, it's usually in areas that are most disturbed. Now, there are exceptions, obviously, um, but we're finding that the lower frequency levels are in area or the lower frequencies of exposure in areas that are less disturbed, which provides more weight to some of the modeling that we've done. So in collaboration with Casilla, we, we've, we've shared the data and, and we've spoken to them about this and, and um, Dr. Munkitschik was kind enough to help us with a community or a company survey looking at the rodent control measures that the companies use and, um, and some of the compounds that they use and so on and so forth and I, the data was, was really great. Um, companies employing more than one rodent control strategy. Fewer than half of the companies use more than one rodent control strategy. And we've discussed an integrated pest management approach where you're utilizing many pest control measures and hopefully using uh, the chemicals as a sort of a last resort. So fewer than half are, are using more than one rodent control strategy. Um, more than three quarters of them are using bromodialone, which is the most common rodenticide uh, detected in fishers. And then um, one company was really happy to report that they use a cat, so that's great. They use other mechanical means, but still not a lot of companies use them. So if we were to formulate um, a, a mitigative uh, option or, or, or program to try to reduce these, these exposures, then again, we preach an integrated pest management approach where we're hopefully using more of these mechanical control measures. We're hopefully, it would be great to move away from bromodialone off to, uh, to another least or less persistent compound and, um, and hopefully uh, decreasing, or sorry, increasing, you know, the, the various rodent control measures that uh, the companies are using. Now, integrated pest management relies on an, ad an uh, adaptive management framework where you need to monitor rodent and rodent populations. So they're costly. Changing a poison is not too costly, but doing a good program where you're monitoring, it's a costly program. Well, what we've shown with the approach with our, our map that I've shown earlier is you can essentially target those areas where you'd want to focus your resources. So basically what this is, is proposing is just it's, it's another model to, um, to basically target uh, some of these areas where you'd really need uh, maybe an intervention or mitigative efforts. Now, you know, I'm super happy that not even a month after presenting this data to industry, Everybody switched over uh, from bromodialone to a, a least uh, persistent compound, ifacinone, which is great. Um, I, I you know, in conclusion, this is the first time fishers are reported exposed to rodenticides in Canada, first time that martens are reported exposed globally. The GIS tools that, that we've, we've shown can help in answering some of these questions, and that data can in turn, like I said, be used to formulate localized and uh, intervention efforts. So our purpose in the wildlife contaminants program, I hope that these two presentations helps you in, in, in realizing this, is, is really an approach where at the center here, we're, we're really like reaching out to indigenous communities and including the stakeholders. So these fishers were used by the provincial government. There's a really active uh, fisher monitoring program. Uh, they were used by these guys. We've shared them. The Alberta Trappers Association, again, shared this data to basically uh, uh, increase, um, you know, trappers. Trappers could be using rodenticides too, so increasing their, their um, um, awareness of the issue. Um, academia, samples were shared. Uh, there's a program, a research program with Alberta Innovates Technology Futures and the University of Victoria. So these samples were shared with these guys as well for a, a Fisher program. And I think which was really great, the industry groups were so proactive in, in, in helping us with this program and, and extremely proactive in, in, in formulating or, or changing their practices away from using some of these second generation compounds. So this is what we like to see. We like to see the data being used by various stakeholders and then and feeding into um, a framework where we can answer relevant questions that we share and relevant concerns and, and also provide some, some tools that uh, could be used to increase the environmental performance of some of these companies.
So on this note, I'd like to thank all First Nations who've been great at uh, pr providing inputs and data and, and carcasses, a uh, number of different federal and, and provincial partners. Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative, these guys are a group of, of wildlife uh, pathologists and veterinarians. They're great at helping us with uh, post-mortem evaluations of, of carcasses. University of Alberta, um, a number of great people there too. Uh, Josem and Casilla for all their help and support. Thank you.